Well, today, oh, I'm going to take his hat off now. Today, I'm driving a car I've been looking forward to driving since before lockdown. I knew this car was coming weeks ago, but we were waiting for some service items to come for it so we could drive it on the road. Then lockdown happened, and now I'm finally at the wheel of a Peugeot 505 Estate. Oh, this thing is fantastic. In May 1979, Peugeot replaced their huge and hugely popular 504 with this, the 505. And in October of the same year, they brought it to the right-hand drive market and Britain got to experience it as well. But it wasn't until 1982 that we got to really enjoy the 505 in its greatest form, the estate. In replacing the 504, the 505 had big shoes to fill. It was a very popular car in the big car sector, but it was a slightly odd competitor because it wasn't quite a competitor for the Granada, the 5 Series, the Senator. But because it was available in such a wide range of specs, it never really nailed itself into the hierarchy of where it sits. You couldn't say it was a direct competitor in terms of snobbiness for a 5 Series, but at the same time, is it less or more working man than a Granada? A Granada is obviously the blue collar man made good, made it into the, uh, the boardroom. But what at the 505? Is this just a guy with a big family? Or is it an independent businessman looking for a big estate? What's the deal with the 505? It's just a car for someone who thinks outside the box in many ways. The 505 did lots of things very well. It's hard to say it does any of them exceptionally, but it does enough things well enough to make it a great all-rounder. But one thing that really does strike everyone who sees it and everyone who remembers it from the 80s is this front end. Peugeot worked with Pininfarina to style this thing, and this kind of arched eyebrow, this squint, is pure France from the 80s. If these headlights were yellow, it could be the most French thing since garlic on toast with frog's legs and every other cliche you can think of wearing a baguette and riding a bicycle. But to someone who grew up in the 1980s, a squinting French car is the only French car that matters. Anything that's not squinting isn't French in my book. But just look at this grill, these headlights. I never really noticed until today. There's a little chrome trim that sits around the back of the light as well, kind of separates it from the wing a little bit more. And it's got so many little angles as well. The little chrome detailing on the front edges is so crisp. The sharp angles are so Italian. This is a really cool bit of design. And something that did strike me when I noticed this uh, front number plate and the window sticker in the back, look where this thing came from. Roots Maidstone. Do you remember I showed you that room where all the cars were handed over in the old Roots dealership? This car will have sat in that room and a proud new owner way back when would have been handed the keys to this car in that building, in that room. I, I love that whole kind of bringing things together. If it wasn't for the whole lockdown, we could have taken this car back to the garage. It's only just down the road. We could have parked it in that room. We could have taken photos in there, filmed it in there. That would have been so good. Oh, what a shame. But looking at other details around the front, look how big these indicators are. It's all very, very clear and legible. It's a very sensible car in a lot of ways. Now I've strolled around the back of the car and it is quite a long stroll and I'll apologise for having sunglasses and a hat on but it is devastatingly hot right now. This by the way, because a few people have commented on the hat, is a Tilly hat. It's a Canadian Army hat if you're bothered by such things. The estate car, as well as coming into production slightly later than the saloon, went out of production slightly later than the saloon as well. The saloon ended production in 1989 having been replaced by both the 405 and the 605 because it kind of sits in between those two size platforms and soldiered on until 1992 when finally a 405 estate came out to replace it because there's no 605 estate. And this is one of those moments where I'm going to have to go and refer to my notes because there's a lot of stuff to tell you at this point. They made a lot of these cars. They made 1,351,254 of them, of which 234,386 were station wagons. That's a lot of cars. The way they did this was building them all around the world. They were built in Sochaux in France, Vigo in Spain, uh, I didn't come with my writing now, Portugal, uh, China, Argentina, Chile, Indonesia by Gaia Motor, uh, Bangkok, Thailand by Yong Tar Kit Motor, uh, Taiwan, um, Nigeria, Malaysia and also in two factories in Australia and Cairo in Egypt, which is why you see so many of them still in Egypt. In fact, they were still making these in China in 1997. It was even one of the uh, many short-lived European exports to, to America, where the French built cars made it over there with a few body changes. There was different exhaust pipe run, lights were different, the bumpers were different, that kind of stuff for the American market. 
Now one universal difference between all estate cars and all saloons is that the wheelbase is longer. It's 2,900 millimeters or just under three meters long for the wheelbase alone on this thing. This is a long old car, which is a little bit longer than the saloon had. And of course you could have had it with a third row seat in it. I can smell it again. I can still smell the carpet or something. I don't know what, but it smells delicious and French and 80s. Oh, I wish I could eat it. Wow, it is warm out there. Oh, I take my hat off because it's too darn hot. Right, I'm gonna give you a little walk through of the interior. I've not done a proper blow by blow every single button, knob, switch and thing on the dashboard for a little while, but uh, I think this car deserves it because it's such a rarity and in the absolute lowest spec virtually as well. So here we are, you can smell the tweed from before you get in the car. There's almost a certain musty smell to the car, which is not meaning like mold or fungus or dry stored smell. It's the smell of this fabric and the foam and the carpet. It's just a slightly unusual, tiny bit sweet, tiny bit dry kind of smell. But yeah, I remember this from the 80s. It's a, yeah, uniquely French smell. And we've got this tweed everywhere, the big brown tweed on the seats, which is completely unworn. Uh, big tweed panels in the door cards. Uh, the brown carpet is very brown indeed. Uh, it's not worn at all. And there's a big plastic heel pad under the driver's feet. You've got a big brown dash top and just caramac beige center section. Even the headlining is a tiny bit beige. This is a festival of brown. Um, the, the little bits of black here and there really do liven it up in a funny sort of way. I'm gobsmacked at the condition of this car. Bear in mind, this car is, what, 40 odd years old, give or take. And, okay, it's only done 32,000 miles, but it looks like a new car in here. It's just fantastic. Okay, so let's start over on the right-hand side. We've got a door, obviously. Uh, got a nice metal door. Pull. Actually, no, it's not metal. It's plastic, some kind of Mazaki type, something somewhere in between metal and plastic door pull. Big solid door grips and armrest, that's nice. Manual windows though, because low spec car. And you've got a, an okay-ish door bin. You're not gonna get much more than a wallet or maybe a, a phone in there. Certainly not gonna get a drinks bottle in that. But this is one absolute, the first piece of interior joy. And there are many pieces of joy with this car. This one, I've never come across a mirror, door mirror, adjusters quite like this. The smaller little ring moves the mirror up and down and the larger ring moves it in and out. That is just bizarre. It's a great idea because you get one axis correct then you can go and correct the other one. How clever is that? It's a nice little thing that. Now you've got the instrument binnacle behind the steering wheel which is surrounded in brown obviously but it's got a nice kind of lozengy shape. This is kind of definitely falling out of the 70s in this bit of design especially when you see all of the orange detailing. My god! Anyone who went to school in the 1980s and remembers, I don't know, the swimming pool, the local sports centre, any bit of yeah, public signography, um, typography, anywhere big Helvetica font numbers and orange everything else. The white and the orange is very, very sharp contrast in terms of, of colour. Uh, it's, it's quite clear, but it's clearly of its time as well. well wow, this, this screams 1983 at me. Uh, sport for all and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's quite an interesting selection of dials and lights on here. Basically, you've mainly got a speedo. This goes up to 110, which is just about going to cut it with that top speeder. Because we're a fairly low entry level model on this one, we've only actually got two other dials. We've got the temperature gauge and the fuel gauge, which are the top half of two circles either side of the, the speedo. Um, and because there's nothing underneath to fill that space, they've just done massive logos for the temperature and the fuel tank. Um, interestingly, uh, even though the car has been off for quite some time, uh, it's still showing the temperature gauge sitting roughly in the middle, so it must be some kind of non-powered system that uh, tells you the temperature regardless whether the engine's running or not, which is slightly unusual. Over to the left, you've got a couple of, well, three warning lights, in fact, for dip beam, uh, main beam, and side lights. And on the right-hand side, you've got your other lights for temperature warning, oil warning, stop warning, uh, handbrake, parking brake, and alternator. A steering wheel, this is kind of cool. It's very French in so much that it's just a very fine two-pronged or two-fingered um, center section. So you've got your center boss here, which I think has the horn in it, where you press the lion. No, you don't press the lion. Wait, wait. Oh, it's on the stalk. It looks like it's a lion, but it's actually a slight bit of padding. Um, the horn's over here. Should we try the horn? 
That's a very French horn, actually. It's quite a commanding horn, but still very French in its own way. Uh, but yeah, those little fingers are very, very, very slight, very dainty, and you've got a quite nice brown steering wheel. Everything's brown. Then between the steering wheel and the dashboard, you've got your two stalks. Now, the left-hand one has the horn. We just tried that. It's also the indicators on the up and the down, but also it rotates for your side light, uh, dip headlight, and main beam. On the right-hand side are the wipers and push for wash. I won't do that because this car is immaculate and it's going to a customer tomorrow. Finally, down here, in this little corner here, we've got a, a little red warning light, which I guess might be for fog lights, perhaps. I'm not quite sure that red warning light's on there. There's an orange warning light, which is on right now because the door is open, telling me the door is open. But down here, we've got a headlight leveler. So I can twist that, and if I've got heavy loads in the boot, I can change the angle of my lights. Now we come to the dashboard itself. Across the front of the dashboard, we've got four air vents, which is, we're getting into the early 80s, and this is when you know, proper ventilation was becoming regularly normal. So we've got vent here, vent on the far right side, two in the, vent here on the right, vent over on the far left, and two in the center, which is a nice spread of, of air coming in the cabin. We've got a little digital clock, which kind of matches everything, and a great big T-shelf. This is a T-shelf worthy of uh, a Rover R8, frankly. And I'm gonna grab the cup. Left. There's no other cup holders in the car, so I didn't bring the cup in, but let's bring the cup for the cup test. Let's bring this in. This is a large cup. We'll see how it goes. Now, I have to say, this has become an industry standard now. The T-shelf test using the Furious Driving Mug is now an industry standard, and it's a pass or fail. And so you can't just make allowances because it's an old car, because they're all old cars, aren't they? When I did the Acclaim last week, a few people were quick to point out, and quite vocal to point out, that they didn't have cups this big back in 1983 when that car was made. Some of them were vocal enough to go ahead and call me a I'll bleep that out so it's the sharp pointy end of something and rhymes with the word Rick. Which I thought was a bit much, considering more than one person called me that. Because of a cup. Get a grip. Um, so yes, this is a standard, so it's a pass or fail. This car is the same age as that Triumph Acclaim, and let's see what happens. An easy pass. So I think I'm vindicated in saying it has a failure of a T-shelf in the Triumph Acclaim, whereas this is a howling success of a T-shelf. You can make it a nine-seat familial, or an eight-seat familial. So uh, yeah, you've got enough room for cups for everyone. I reckon you can get probably three cups along each one of these little air major areas, and then two in there. So if it's an eight-seater car, you've got eight cups along the front. Success. Stick that. Now, going down below, there are lots of other options which you can have on this car but this one didn't get it because it is a low spec car. You've got a fan speed, which goes up to four. You have your ventilation destination, which is windscreen at the top and feet at the bottom and any destination in between. And it appears to have fresh air face ventilation using this switch here, so off and on. So the blue arrow to the face. So maybe these two center um, vents here can just have cold air blowing on you, which is very, on a day like today, would be absolutely lovely. And of course you've got your main temperature control just here. Now the only other three buttons we've got on this panel are rear fog, uh, hazard warning lights, and rear screen heater. So presumably we could have had front fogs, um, electric windows perhaps? No, electric windows would be down here on these blanking plugs, wouldn't they? Um, I don't know, we, uh, maybe it's air conditioning. Could we have air conditioning on this car perhaps? And certainly in the hot countries you might have done. There's a huge blanking plate in the center, which does nothing in this car. So I'd be very curious to know what else we could have had, but I'm gonna say air conditioning was a thing. What we have got though is a radio. It's a Philips radio, so may well be original to the car. It's a large metal, Panel which kind of blanks off that whole area with visible screws, which that's an interesting thing, is it? Cars of the 80s had visible screws. You never see a screw or a fixing on a car anymore. Everything's just so well hidden now. You've got your blanking plates, which I'm gonna hazard a guess would be for electric windows, probably not for heated seats. Maybe heated seats on the absolute top of the range car, but blanking plates here. An automatic gearbox here in the center. Three-speed auto, wow. You are not living the dream with a three-speed auto. Um, but for some people, it's the right option. And a car like this, which is, well, let's call it leisurely anyway, this is probably not a bad fit, to be fair. We'll find out in a moment, won't we? Then we've got a big old mechanical handbrake. Well, that's a lot of plastic. Quite plasticky plastic as well, if I'm honest. Um, little tray here for putting stuff in, little tray for stuff to fall out of behind it. Not quite sure what's going on there. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it. We've got sun visors, left and right, a mirror in the passenger side one. A little courtesy light, which comes on with the doors. 
let's leave off so it runs battery flat for them. And that's the front seats. Lots of legroom, very wide. The seats are big, spongy and comfy and loads of headroom. This is a big, comfy car, so you can really relax in this thing. Let's have a look in the back seat and see what we think of that. Wow, this is where the 505 really comes into its own. It's a big car for big families and you could have had families of big people back here as well because there is an absolute ton of space. Now, the thing that really strikes you apart from the brownness and the uh, tweediness, which is also very nice, is that like in a Discovery uh, from Land Rover, you've got the grandstand uh, stadium seating where you can see over the front seat passengers for like a nicer view for the rear seat passengers because this seat is really, really high up. I mean, I feel like I'm sitting like in the top deck of a bus or something because I'm so high up. In terms of comfort, that's great though because it means that my knees aren't pushed at a funny angle. I can sit kind of naturally and I've got a ton of foot space. I've got a ton of knee space. I've got loads of elbow room as well. Um, there are three seat belts back here. So this is a, a five seater car in this configuration. Um, but I put the seat, driver's seat back quite a long way. But even so, I've got so much space back here. I can just really relax and enjoy this. No wonder these are so popular as taxis. Um, my only real criticism, the seat itself is very comfortable. It's a big, squishy, soft bench seat. But my only real criticism is the fact that uh, the back of it is quite low. So, you, so the top edge of it kind of digs into your shoulder blades a little bit and there's no headrests. If there's any kind of whiplashy in incident, then uh, you're not in too good of a place. Um, these seats do fold forward though. This is a cavernous boot behind me as well. Uh, but these seats, this base rolls forward and this back folds flat. So you can turn this whole thing into a vast, like a transit van effectively. Now, what have you got in terms of equipment back here? Well, let's go through it, shall we? We've got a little light in both C posts over your shoulder so you can read a book or a magazine or something. So you can read stuff while you're on, on the move in the back. There are little seat back uh, map pockets in lovely delicious tweed on both seats. You've got a non-central variety lock and you've got a door handle obviously and a manual window winder because manual windows lovely bit of brown carpet in all, all four door bottoms so you don't kick the door as is a nice bit of uh, sound deadening as well and an ashtray in both doors as well that's kind of it really in the back of the center console there is a strange little flat tray area which looks like it should be something but it's not really anything and there's a, a big nubbin which looks like it should pull out but it doesn't it's just a big plastic nubbin for no reason but yeah that's all right that said this is a huge comfy back seat in a very big comfy car shall we look at the boot now now there's probably one major reason you're buying a 505 estate i'm going to say it's this because that goes back a very very long way oh, i've returned to the hat because i'm outside the car and it is enormously hot outside today right i'm gonna climb right back in here get in the shade now can you still see me can you still hear me? Can you hear me now? It's a long way from the back of the boot to the front of the boot. This was available with a fold up row of seats here in the back as well. So you could turn it into a proper minibus sort of thing, which is where so many of its sales went to uh, because big families didn't have the option of MPVs back then. So they bought an estate car with a huge boot and a third row of seats. Um, and this is just enormous, but also they were bought by tradespeople who wanted something more comfortable than a van as well. Taxi drivers loved them. In fact, the last time I went in one of these was in Egypt about 15 years ago, and there were just taxis of these everywhere. And still in the early noughties, there were just every taxi cab was an estate one of these. I may have the uh, literage written down in a bit of paper somewhere, but uh, suffice to say, it's blooming big. I can't not do a folding rear seat test for you. Look, so very simply, the bench just lifts forward on that little tag there. You have to move the seats forward for this. Then the seat back falls into this carpeted area here. And you now have a completely flat area all the way to the front seats, which is, well, you could park a car in here. It's massive. It's absolutely ridiculous how big the space is. Now here under the bonnet, it's the same kind of unrestored originality, but because it's the working part of the car, there's a little bit more dust and I say grime isn't really the right word, but it's lived in it, but it's totally original. When you look at this plastic is not perfect, but that's just how it's gone over the years. But looking at these stickers and things, we've got the uh, use only brake fluid um, sticker over here, Lockheed 55 in multiple languages. And we've got these two stickers down here as well. Um, attention in uh, French, German, British, Italian, Spanish, and Arabic. And what's these two about actually? These um, permanent cooling liquid protected to plus five Fahrenheit drain every two years 
uh, pressurized cooling circuit to not open during one hour following engine cutoff. So, and also there's some stenciled uh, marking over here, 1345 RM, which I guess is something to do with the, the chassis number, the build number as it went down the production line perhaps, because that's your chassis plate is over there. But the engine itself though, here it is in the middle, the two litre, is that carburetor fed? Yeah, I think it is. 1971cc, um, four-cylinder, non-turbo, um, eight valve. It's, it's fairly rudimentary, but it's the kind of tough thing that just kind of lasts and lasts and lasts. It's not built for high output, it's built for longevity and to run on pretty much anything, but you know, washing up liquid in the tank, it'll still run on that. It makes 96 horsepower, which is okay. Well, I say it was okay back in the 60s. It was starting to be on the small side for a two liter in the 80s, but for this kind of car, it's okay. It also makes 161 Newton meters of torque. So it's got a bit of pull to it. So it'll just chug on quite happily. It'll manage not to 16 in 13 and a half seconds and trundle up to 108 miles an hour in the end. Enjoyed this little ride out. It's a very brief ride out in a car. I have to be very careful with because it's going to a customer imminently. So what can I say about Peugeot 505 Estate at the wheel? Well, it's very smooth. It's a two liter petrol, which is not massively powerful, but it is very gentle. You know, it's got a nice, Nice tinkling sound as you drive along. You can sort of hear the fuel running through the inlet and it sounds quite tinkling, quite fresh and sweet. This thing has got independent suspension. This has got independent suspension all round. It's uh, McPherson struts at the front, trailing arms at the rear, and uh, that does give it a nice ride, you sort of roll through the corners quite happily and it soaks up the bumps so well. Bear in mind, these were massive sellers in a lot of countries, like African countries, for example, where the roads are more or less unmade and so it was able to sort of just crash down dirt tracks virtually with no hassle whatsoever. It would happily just plow along them, no worries. And one quite cool thing I didn't mention when I was walking around doing the dashboard is that under the picture of the petrol gauge, you've got a little word, Econoscope. And as I put my foot down on the hill, it drops into the amber. If I put my foot really hard down, oh, it doesn't go to red, I thought it would. I do like an Econoscope though. It sounds very uh, Jerry Anderson-like. Steering on this thing is so light. give you a brake test right now because there's a BMW sat right behind us. I don't want him to be uh, embedded. There's room for him to come into the boot and join us, but uh, I don't really want him to do that. Now these things are insanely rare now from that quarter of a million estate cars. There are now under 50 505s on the road in the UK which is an astonishing downfall in terms of numbers of cars. This car survived by being, well, basically laid up. In 1991, the last time it was taxed, it was parked in a barn, literally a barn find, and uh, hasn't moved in 29 years until recently when Stone Cold Classics got hold of it and basically refreshed it. You know, give it a full service, new tires, um, good old clean. Didn't really have to do anything major to it, just really, really good clean which is remarkable. I'll be honest, the carburetor isn't 100% happy yet after its long layup, and it's a little bit spluttery at low speeds, but once you're on the move, it seems fairly happy to, to trundle around. The auto box shifts quite happily as well. It's a nice smooth thing.
There are always disc brakes on the front, but different markets got different arrangements of discs or drums on the rear of the car. I hope you've enjoyed this very brief ride out in this Peugeot 505. It's a car that was part of my childhood, but honestly, I don't remember the last time I saw one. I say part of my childhood, not that my family had one, but they were just everywhere. Every family of more than three kids seemed to have one of these back in the early 80s. Oh, this thing is just lovely. Thanks for coming along, I hope you've enjoyed the ride. If you have, you know the drill, like, subscribe, share, all that kind of stuff that really matters to us YouTube types. And I know that annoys some people, but ultimately it's the lifeblood of the channel. Hitting subscribe matters to YouTubers. I'm sorry it does, no matter if it does annoy you guys. Join me again next time with something very, very different. That's all I can say because I don't even know yet.